I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way. And you shall wear the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and to show with the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. Oh, sinners, let's go. To pray as I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Good morning and welcome to Calvary Arlington Online. We are glad you're here with us this morning, whether you are watching on YouTube or Facebook, we are glad you are here. Uh, let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. We're continuing in our study in Hebrews chapter 7, and today we have a, a great lesson, just as it's, a, it's an introductory lesson in the sense of we're going to take it in a few chunks, but we're looking at the character of Melchizedek. Uh, the writer of Hebrews has kind of teased this idea of an otherwise unknown and unconsidered uh, individual, this uh, man Melchizedek. And uh, he has shown how, in, in the letter, he's shown how Jesus, our eternal king, is better than the prophets, uh, better than the angels, better than Moses. Now, he is going to demonstrate how Jesus is better than uh, what the Jews would have understood as the Levitical priesthood. So, he's going to show how Jesus is better than that. And then also, uh, he will demonstrate how Jesus is better than Abraham. So, what he's doing, kind of just understand this, He's knocking down religious idols. He's knocking down, uh, you know, he's not just knocking the religion, but in the sense that they would have a tendency, uh, because of persecution, to go back to those former things. He is showing how, no, Jesus is better than all of the religion that you were formerly part of. I want to uh, read, we're going to be looking today uh, at verses 1 through 10. So read along with me. Hebrews chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 10. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth part of all the spoils, first of all by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, 
he remains a priest perpetually. Now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham, but the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had made the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them um, of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. And so to speak, uh, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Previously, we read about this individual Melchizedek. The, the writer has wanted to talk about him. He has mentioned him briefly uh, in chapter 5, verse 10. It says that, uh, uh, speaking of Jesus here, he was, a, he was designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, I want you to take note of this idea uh, that's given to us in this language. He was designated by God. That's very a kind of an important point that the writer is making. And he, we saw this idea repeated twice in chapter 5. And then uh, the idea of uh, Melchizedek as high priest is mentioned again uh, as we get to the end of chapter 6 in verse 20. It says, Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So, so three times then in Hebrews chapter 5, twice, and then once in chapter 6, uh, it's mentioned that Jesus is a priest, a high priest, according to this order of Melchizedek. The first point is that he was designated by God as a high priest, and then in 620, uh, the writer makes this point that he was designated a high priest forever. He, he is a high priest, remains a high priest forever. So take note of the idea of being designated by God and then also a high priest forever. Now, all of these verses kind of stem from uh, just a, a handful of verses that we'll look at in Genesis 14, but then also in Psalm 110.4, which is a messianic psalm. Uh, we understand that in Psalm 110, uh, clearly he's writing about Jesus Christ, the Savior, and Psalm 110, 4 says this, The Lord has sworn and will not change His mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So, uh, that's, the, that's the repeated line here in, in Hebrews 5 and 6, um, and it's what the author has in mind. So, we're going to be looking uh, today at the introduction of this guy, Melchizedek, this man, Melchizedek, who is just mentioned four, in four verses in the Old Testament. Again, uh, in the three verses in Genesis 14, and then also in that Psalm 110.4. Uh, so, even though he's just got a little bit, kind of a bit mentioned, you might say, he's a bit player in the Old Testament, um, the writer is making it really clear, Melchizedek is a very, very important figure. Um, and... Uh, not an easy figure, as he has made very clear. Uh, in a sense, understanding Melchizedek is difficult. Um, now, he wants us to understand uh, this guy. And, and if you look at verse 4 again, look at what he says. He sub says, now observe how great this man was. Again, he is pointing to him as being a very important figure. Now, first of all, I would just say from the text, it's very clear, and this is kind of point number one, as we are considering how great he is, he has a great name. Melchizedek has a great name. In that, he's, he's like Christ, right? Jesus Christ is the name above every name, but Melchizedek has a great name. Now, look at what he says. 
uh, by, trans- the, by the translation of his name. His name, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness. He, he, he's king of righteousness. The text tells us that he's also the king of Salem, which, which is the king of peace. Salem is that earlier name for Jerusalem. So when you read about the, the place called Salem, it's referring to Jerusalem as it was formerly known. Um, and that word, of course, is uh, Jerusalem. It comes from uh, Shalem, uh, which is Shalom. It's peace. It's a very, very interesting thing that he has this incredible, this great name. I was thinking about it in relation to my own name. I don't know, uh, you know, depending on what your name is, some some names have incredibly significant meanings. What does your name mean? Have you ever thought about that? I was I was thinking about it um, in light of my own name and the idea that names can be very significant. Um, I've never done one of those ancestry searches. I've never gone deep into, you know, the Jacobson uh, ancestry. But I have wondered uh, that at some point, someone, uh, you know, gave our family, they adopted, they took hold of that name, Jacobson, which is son of Jacob. So it it clearly has some some, uh, Christian or Hebrew roots, some Jewish roots, somewhere, someone along the line. Uh, was a, a follower of God and took that surname, uh, Jacobson, or son of Jacob. Jacob means supplanter, literally. Uh, it, it was, you know, Jacob was called heel catcher. It was Jacob meant uh, supplanter or heel catcher because when he was born, uh, you know, he was a twin with Esau, and when he was born, he came out second, hanging onto Esau's heel, and thus. He was given the name Jacob or heel catcher. Actually, uh, you know, I've done a little bit of reading about my first name, which is James. You know, I go by Jim, but my my given name is James. And uh, the interesting thing about it is that name actually is derived from the same Hebrew word Jacob. Uh, so actually, my name, you know, if if you were to go back in into the the etymology of my name. It's literally uh, Jacob, son of Jacob. So anyway, I didn't I didn't know that till recently, but it's kind of interesting. There are there there are some fascinating things about names, and names can be in the scriptures. They can be very important. I think it would just you know uh, safe to say Melchizedek has a pretty awesome name, right? He has a pretty awesome name. It, it's difficult for us to, to pronounce. Uh, it's definitely difficult for us to spell. Uh, um, but it's an awesome name. He's known as the King of Righteousness. That's an awesome title. He's also uh, uh, got the name King of Peace. You can imagine if he was a politician, what the, the uh, marketing, what the campaign would be like. Oh yeah. By the way, I'm the king of righteousness. I'm the king of peace. It's a great name. Melchizedek has a great name. The second thing we note uh, from the text is his great characteristics. He's got a great name, and then he's got certain characteristics that he's known by. And you would just have to say they are great, even incredible characteristics. Now, the main point that the writer is making We kind of have to remind ourselves of this over and over again. He's making the point uh, in Hebrews that Jesus is better, uh, better than than all the things that the the people of the Jewish background would know. But the point here that he's going into is that Jesus is better than the Levitical priests. So he's going to demonstrate that, showing how um, not only Melchizedek, but then Jesus has better characteristics and qualifications as high priest of a different order. So he's uh, got the Levitical priests in mind. Uh, This would have been what was in mind. As soon as you talk about high priest, that's what the the Jews would be thinking of, right? They'd be thinking of the Levitical priests. And so the author is saying, no, Melchizedek is better, and therefore Jesus is better, because Jesus is uh, not of the Levitical priesthood, He's of uh, Melchizedek's priesthood, of that order. Now, look at these great characteristics. Look at verse 3 again. 
it says this of Melchizedek. He is without father, he is without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Though clearly, though clearly I would say Melchizedek is a man, and we'll see that when we look at Genesis uh, 14, uh, there's no record of his genealogy. Uh, he remains a bit of a mystery, right? In, 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 in Christian circles, he's a bit of a mystery. It was highly unusual in the Jewish culture for no record to be given of an individual's genealogy. There are endless genealogies in the Old Testament. If you ever read through the Old Testament, you know that there can be these, you know, full pages of genealogies that are just like absolutely boring, and you wonder, what is the relevance? Well, uh, it's important for them, it was important for them to see the connectedness of them as individuals and as families, and of course, uh, this figured very importantly into the identification of the Messiah, that it was foretold that the Messiah would come from the line of David. So these genealogies are very, very important. And so uh, the introduction of Christ in the Gospels includes uh, the genealogies which identify him uh, as uh, being qualified to be uh, the Messiah, that he would be of the line of David. So it's interesting that Melchizedek has no genealogy. Now, this leads to another very, very interesting discussion as we consider who is this guy? Who is this guy that it says he's without father or mother? Is this to be taken literally, or is the writer speaking metaphorically, even while he's writing about an actual person? Some believe that Melchizedek is, is what as, is known in theological circles as a Christophany, a Christophany, which is a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, we already know, again, foundationally, keep in mind what the writer in Hebrews told us in verse 11 of chapter 5. Uh, he says he wants to talk about Mel Melchizedek, but he says concerning him, we have much to say. It's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. Uh, the discussion that we're having today, that we're beginning to have today, is, is kind of a deep end discussion. It's, it's, it's not lightweight stuff, right? There's so many uh, things in the scriptures that are, that are easy, right? You've, you've got all kinds of stories, all, all, all kinds of things that we could, we could talk about that are, that are in a sense uh, light and easy, easy to understand, easy to comprehend. But then there are some things that this is one of those that's difficult to understand. It's, it's, it's like you got, you got to get your brain around it. And so I would just say this is a little bit of a mind bender, but this idea of Jesus Christ presenting himself before even his incarnation, uh, it's not isolated to this. Now, having said that, I want to be really clear. This isn't necessarily a Christophany, but it could be. And there's other Old Testament examples of that concept of uh, Christophany. And I want to show you one, just so as, as we're talking about this, you could kind of see it a little bit more clearly. I want you to look at Joshua chapter 5. Turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 5. This is just one of my all-time great uh, favorite stories in the Old Testament. I love the study of Joshua but in Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, we have very clearly uh, what is called a Christophany. It says, It came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. It's a great, what a great line. It's like God just, you know, this, this individual just says, No, rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. It says, And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he bowed down, and he said to him, What is my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy and Joshua did so. Now, this passage contains 
contains overwhelming evidence that Joshua here was visited by none other than the Son of God. This could not be an angel. There are times when, when angels are referred to as uh, sons of God, you know, uh, not capitalized in the sense of they're, they're messengers from God. Um, this is not that. And the reason why we know that this is not that is because, number one, uh, worship is received. Joshua bows to the ground. Now, in the New Testament, whenever we see this kind of a thing, uh, the angels say, no, get up. Right? They, they do not, angels do not receive worship, whereas this individual receives worship. And, and the second thing is just the language that he uses here. He tells Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet for the place where you were standing is holy. This is the same language that God spoke to Moses when he approached the burning bush. The place where you are standing is holy. Uh, clearly, this was a visitation in the Old Testament of the Lord. Now, now again, that's not easy to understand. You, 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 you know, it, it's, it's, it's not something that happens a lot. Um, nonetheless, that's what's happening in Joshua chapter 5. And I would just say many, uh, many Christian teachers believe that that's what we're seeing, uh, what we will talk about when we look at Genesis chapter 14 and the visitation of Melchizedek. Again, when you look at his characteristics, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, it says he remains a priest perpetually. Now, in fairness, the writer could simply be speaking metaphorically uh, because no record existed, right? There was no record given in the Old Testament of this individual uh, named Melchizedek. And so it could be that it's kind of like the argument when you find money laying in the street, right? Uh, we would say, hey, I, I, I don't see the person who dropped it. I don't see anybody doesn't have anybody's name on it. It must belong to me. Uh, of course, it belongs to somebody, but in that case, we claim it for our own because uh, we don't know whose it is. It could be that that is is what's going on here, and the, the writer in Hebrews is speaking metaphorically. Uh, nevertheless, the point is, um, this is a unique individual, and he is a type. As it says, he is like the Son of God, and so he is a type of Christ. Now, the main points that he makes is, is first of all, that he's not of the Levitical line of priests. That's one of his big points here, is, is that um, Jesus is not of the Levitical priesthood because Melchizedek is not of the Levitical priesthood. In fact, it says he is, a, he is designated, we read that earlier, he's designated by God as a high priest. So, and again, if you look at verse 6, it says, one whose genealogy is not traced from them. So, uh, Melchizedek, he was a priest outside of and before the establishment of the law and the Levitical priesthood. And therefore, the, and this is the, the point that he's making, and therefore so is Jesus. So he's establishing that, but then also that Jesus is better. The second uh, point uh, in these important characteristics is one that uh, Jesus has the eternal priesthood. Again, in chapter 6, verse 20, he's become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And as it says, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God. So there's this idea that he remains a priest perpetually. Uh, it could be that Melchizedek was, in fact, Jesus establishing these things in advance. And again, that's what we would call the Christophany. Or it could be that Melchizedek simply stands uh, alone as this unique figure in Jewish history as a type of what was to come. Either way, I think it's a, fant it's a, a fascinating study. Uh, and the similarities and the characteristics... Uh, there are many, even more than we've already mentioned, as we'll see as we continue. Now, we will see more when we go back 
to that study in Genesis 14. So I want to look at the, the verses in Genesis 14. Turn back there. Uh, and while you're turning back to Genesis 14, leave your leave your, your hand or your marker. Or, you know, if you're using an app, of course, it's a little bit different. But, but hang on to Hebrews chapter 7 because we'll be going back. Now, um, we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 20, but let me set the scene a little bit. Uh, in Abraham's day, there was a battle initiated by uh, four kings under the leadership of a guy named uh, Chedo Leomar, uh, king of Elam. And he went against five kings in the valley uh, where the, of the Dead Sea region. And the f invading four kings conquered the five kings, including... Sodom, and they took away all of the spoil and many of the people, including Abraham's nephew Lot, who had lived in Sodom. So, Abraham, in response to this, uh, he got his own army together, and he went out to war uh, against those four kings, and he defeated them and rescued all the people who had been taken captive, including Lot. As well, he took all of the spoils of war, all of the treasure. As Abraham was returning from this very significant battle, he has this very significant encounter with this character, Melchizedek. And so let's read uh, Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20. Then after his return from the defeat of Chido Leomar, Leomar, boy, try to pronounce that ten times fast. And the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shava, that is, in the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. Now, we already know Melchizedek's name is great. King of righteousness, king of peace. But now we're given the nature of his ministry. He is a priest of God Most High. He has a great name. He has great characteristics. He has a great ministry. Priest of God Most High. Now, one of the most interesting aspects to this is something that the, the Hebrews would know, right? Those of a Jewish background would know, but the typical Christian would not. And that is that according to the law, priests had to be Levites, while there's no law prohibiting a priest from being a king, unless a king were a descendant of Levi, he could not be a priest. And according to the law of Moses, uh, the line of kings must follow the line of David and therefore be from the tribe of Judah. So no king of Judah or Israel could be a priest. So Melchizedek is unique in that he is both a king and a priest, he's holding both offices. Now, this again is, is an incredible type of Jesus who himself holds both offices. He is both king and, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, the great high priest. Not just the high priest, but the great high priest. Now, Zechariah the prophet wrote of this dual office um, idea in regard to the Messiah. In Zechariah chapter 6, verse 13, uh, listen to the word of the Lord. It says, Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. And so there, writing of the Messiah to come, he will be both a king, he will be on the throne. He will rule from the throne, but then also hold the office of priest. Now again, uh, verse 4 of Hebrews 7 says, Observe, observe how great this man uh, was, um, you know, to the, the, that came out to meet Abraham. 
Uh, so I want to look at, at four different things in regard to this great ministry of Melchizedek's priesthood. Number one, notice that he blesses Abraham. He blesses him. Uh, you know, this is... Look again at, at the, the... He says, blessed, verse 19 of Genesis 14. Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. He pronounces a blessing upon him. And then, and then uh, the, the writer in Hebrews uh, makes a point of this. He says, without any dispute... In other words, this isn't even arguable, right? That's his point. The lesser is blessed by the greater. And so his point there is, listen, as we're considering the great ministry of Melchizedek, he is greater than Abraham, right? That He's able to pronounce, in a sense, he's pronouncing blessing over Abraham. Uh, that's not done by the lesser, that's done by the greater. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. And so uh, that's, that's one of the points of this great ministry, he blesses Abraham. The second thing we see is that he serves Abraham. He doesn't just serve Abraham, he serves Abraham a sacred meal. He comes out with bread and wine. Now, I think this is one of the strongest arguments for the idea of Christophany. He brings out and serves Abraham the elements of what's known to us as New Testament Christians as the Lord's Supper. He comes out with basically Christian communion. He is ministering them, to him and, and providing for him uh, what we have as the, you know, one of the chief ordinances of the church to remember the Lord, right? Every week, every day, we're remembering the Lord in our communion. Here, this is what he brings out to him. How incredible. He's ministering to him. And again, although he is greater than him, he is ministering to him. He's serving him. And this, of course, is a major element of Jesus' ministry. He is greater than all, yet he became the servant of all. And so, he blesses Abraham in his greater ministry. He serves Abraham a sacred meal in his greater ministry. The third thing we see, uh, he gives glory to God. Uh, he says, and he, he, he blesses Abraham, but then he gives glory to God. He says, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. You know what he's doing here? He's leading Abraham in worship. Abraham is coming back from battle. He comes and he meets with this guy Melchizedek. Melchizedek pronounces a blessing over him. He brings out the bread and the wine. He provides a sacred meal. And then, what does he do? He leads him in worship. Let's give glory to God. How wonderful. How beautiful. This is a great ministry that Melchizedek, the high priest of God, has. Fourthly, we see that he receives a tithe from Abraham. It says he gave him a tenth of all. I think this is one of the most interesting and perhaps challenging aspects of the ministry of uh, Melchizedek, or that we see in the ministry of Melchizedek. And I think as we look at it, this can be a very challenging word to the church of Jesus Christ. When we consider the idea of giving and the idea of tithing and all of that, one of the most well-known verses on giving, you probably know it, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Paul writes, Each one... Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And when we read that, we read that verse, it seems as though God is giving instructions, not just for us to give, but to give at a level uh, that we are comfortable with. After all, if, if we're not cheerful, well, God doesn't love that. God loves a cheerful giver. And so we conclude that what is appropriate is whatever we can kind of be happy about, whatever we can joyously give. After all, we would be quick to say as New Testament Christians, we're not under any legal obligation to give. The Jews were under legal obligation to give according to the law. Uh, and, and the same is true in, in religions all over the world. There's a legal obligation within religion 
to support that religion and to give to God uh, through, through giving. It's a legal obligation. Now, while that is true theologically, Genesis 14 presents, I think, a great challenge. How did, this is a, a question that I want you to just to consider, how did Abraham arrive at the idea of a tenth? It seems entirely arbitrary. There's no mention of it before this. And, 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 and this, this tenth, this is the definition of the word tithe. Tithe is 10%. It, it means 10%. It's important for Christians to understand that. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in regard to the language about giving. Uh, I've seen checks uh, written for $15 but in the memo, uh, people have written tithe. Now, uh, unless you make $150, that's not a tithe. That's an offering. It's a gift, right? It, 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 and, and, and there's nothing bad about it. It's just a misunderstanding when you consider it to be a tithe. It's not a tithe. A tithe, by definition, is 10%. Now, there's debate in the Christian church. It's kind of an in-house debate, an in-house discussion. And, and, and again, I think it can get very uncomfortable very quickly for many of us. But the question is this, and I think this is the very important question when we consider giving. What should Christians give? How much should Christians give? Now consider this. In light of the text that we read, before the law, before the law, before any legal obligations were put in, fit, in place, Abraham tithed to, Mel, to Melchizedek. I think it's, an argu it's, a, it's, a, it's a logical argument for tithing for Christians. When we look at Abraham in the New Testament, right? when we look at him as an example in the New Testament, he is presented as evidence of sal uh, salvation apart from the law. There are many verses uh, where he is put forward as an example because he was declared righteous because he believed God before and apart from the law and before and apart from religion. Logically, I think his example of giving remains as an example for us. And so the question is um, a question of proportion. Uh, there seems to be a proportion that God has in mind that's appropriate. Now, I will call your attention to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. It says this, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. On the first day of the week, uh, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. Paul is writing instructions to the church in Corinth, and he says, listen, this is how I want you to save, this is how I want you to give, I want you to give, and notice what he says, it's, it's it, to the level of their prosperity. He says, as he may prosper. And so, he is talking about there, there is a proportion to your giving that ought to be in keeping with how God has blessed you, how God has provided for you, you ought to give in proportion to that. And so the question is, in what proportion? What proportion? Well, again, our text, Abraham, before the law, before the religion, he arrived at a proportion of 10%. I want to further uh, point out Paul's teaching on this matter in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Listen to these words. Now this I say, this I say, he who sp sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he is purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Notice there, there is that verse about God loving a cheerful giver, but there's a context to it. 
And the context to it is this great promise that he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So there is, in God's mind and according to God's word, there is proportion involved. And basically what God's saying is, listen, to the degree that you give, I am going to bless you. I heard a pastor who was teaching about this principle of proportionate giving. And after teaching, uh, a man came up to him, approached the pulpit, and he was very upset. Uh, maybe some of you watching this, listening to this, you're upset. You're like, oh no, come on. You, you, you might have the same arguments that this guy had. God loves a cheerful giver, right? Uh, I, I should give what I'm happy to give. And no more. We're not under the law. Now to those things I would say you're right. But the pastor reminded the man again of this promise here. He says, he said to the man, quoting this verse, He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. The man was still upset. He couldn't get over it. And so, The pastor, he didn't really have anything else to say, and so he gently concluded the conversation by saying the following. If you will not give according to how you have been blessed, then may you be blessed according to how you give. Let me say that again. If you will not give according to how you have been blessed, then may you be blessed according to how you give. The principle of ministry between Melchizedek and Abraham was exactly like Paul's description of his own ministry. In 1 Corinthians 9, he said, If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Abraham uh, received from Melchizedek spiritual things and he gave Material things. Abraham was blessed. The blessing was pronounced over him. Melchizedek pronounced the blessing over Abraham. That was real. That was significant. That's a a legitimate role of the priest. Abraham was served a sacred meal. He was was served something spiritual. A blessing. uh, This sacred meal. He was led in worship. And here, here's an important point. Please, please don't miss this. Abraham had the privilege of giving to God through Melchizedek. But we give by faith. It's an act of worship. It's an act of gratitude. And and it's not as much for the recipient as it is for the giver. You need to understand that, Christian. You need to understand it. It's not that God needs your money. It's not that the church needs your money. It's that it's actually good for you. It's a privilege. It's an act of worship. Remember what Jesus said about the Sabbath? The Sabbath was an ordinance that every Jew understood, that even that has translated into us and our practice of Christianity, to take a day uh, of rest. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 2. He said this very, very important statement about the Sabbath, this ordinance that God had given to man. He said, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for man. In other words, he's saying, it's of benefit to you. I've instituted this for you. It's not for me, it's for you. We don't serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath serves us. The principle of giving is exactly the same. When we give to God... We're blessed. When we give to God, we're we're blessed. God knows that we are selfish people. God knows that we have a tendency to rely on material things and to and to, to, to have treasures and to build up our treasures, right? God knows that. And so He's given us the idea of giving so that we will not be selfish people, so that we will not be overly materialistic. Giving helps us to learn to be gracious, to be generous, to be like Him. Because you can't outgive God. 
He blesses. He causes us to be bountiful. We reap bountifully as we sow bountifully. Now, in regard to this giving, the writer of Hebrews makes one final point here that I think is important uh, in the overall picture as we're looking at Melchizedek and the, and the greater ministry of Melchizedek and the even greater ministry of Christ. He says back in our text, Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. For, as it says in verse 10, he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Melchizedek was greater than Abraham. Melchizedek's priesthood was greater than the Levitical priesthood. And since Jesus is of the order of Melchizedek, he is greater still. I want to circle back to the names associated with with Melchizedek as we close today. Again, his names are very significant. King of Righteousness and King of Peace. It might seem insignificant, but the order of those names is is as significant as what they mean. Righteousness comes first. Peace comes second. Sometimes people think that they can find peace while at the same time ignoring God and His standard of righteousness. Friends, you might find some temporary peace apart from God. There's a whole host of things in our world uh, that may bring some temporary joy, even at some level of peace. But in regard to real joy, And real peace, those alone come from God. Real peace, real peace with God comes through His righteousness. And you can have that. Right? You and I, we can have that through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the whole point in Hebrews. He's pointing over and over, the text is pointing over and over and over to the ministry of Jesus Christ. He's looking back here at Melchizedek, who is a type of Christ, who may have actually been Christ. That righteousness and that subsequent peace, he wants to minister to you as well. And he'll give it to you. He'll give you his righteousness. And when you have his righteousness, You therefore have peace with God. Jesus Christ came to take away the guilt of your sin. Right? The Bible makes that really clear that you and I, as fallen human beings, we are sinners. We are declared unjust, unright before God. And because of that, as it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, there is a penalty for that. The wages of sin is death. We have a separation from God because of our sins. But Jesus Christ came to take away that sin and to give you and I His righteousness. And when we turn to Him, when we come to Him and we confess our sins and we ask Him for forgiveness, the Bible tells us that He will forgive us and that He also in turn gives us His peace. And that peace the Bible describes as a peace that surpasses understanding. It surpasses comprehension. It's a blessing. Jesus, in the, in the same way that Melchizedek wanted to minister to Abraham, Jesus wants to minister to you. He wants to pronounce a blessing over your life. And He will, as you come to Him and put your faith and trust in Him. I pray that this has been an encouraging study to you. Uh, no matter if you've been a Christian for a long time or or, or you're not yet a Christian, I, I encourage you uh, to look to Jesus Christ and to look to His ministry, His better ministry as the High Priest of God. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word this morning. and I got, God, I just pray that You would minister to each one of us, Lord, these words, that they would sink into our hearts. 
Lord, some of the things we've heard are difficult. Some of the things are difficult to understand. Some of the things are, are difficult in that they ruffle our human feathers. And yet, God, we, we want to be submitted to your word. We want to receive your word. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Wherever our life is, is not lined up with your word, Lord, we, we want to ask for your forgiveness and your grace. Lord, we pray that you give us your righteousness in exchange for our sins. And that you'd give us, each one of us, Lord, that peace that only you can give. Jesus, we come to you, the King of righteousness. Jesus, you're the King of peace. We pray that you would flood our lives with your righteousness and peace. In Jesus' name, amen.